So, welcome to the third talk that's for this term. We've only got one more after this. Uh, today, this is perhaps not a surprise, but we're going to be talking about fear. Um, with the horrendously titled Facing Your Fear. Now, um, as you can see, I mean, I always leave the kind of contact details up there, my Twitter handle, my email address, but also at the Patreon feed. <clears throat> when it came to starting to do this whole online blogging thing and everything else, it all started because of fear. And the reason is that, because I was teaching my AI class game behavior last year, and I was trying to do some sort of one-off talk about fear. And I did it in the first year I'd ran the class, and this was the second time around I was teaching it. And what I would do is <clears throat> I would give this presentation to the lecture, and it was a one-off. And I'd maybe throw together a bunch of slides just to talk about fear. And the first, the first year I did it, it went down really well. The students really enjoyed it. And I thought, right, we'll do that one again. And then I realized that I seemed to be going through this whole element of prep repeatedly, because I had to go back and prep it again to make sure that this talk was going to work out. And I thought instead, well, this time, why don't I write it as a blog page on my website? Because that would be really cool. Then halfway through that, because I am prone to having good ideas at the worst possible time, I said, well, maybe I should do like a YouTube video which ties into the written piece, and then it's this nice cohesive package that I can give to my students and go, hey, guys, check this out. I went and did all this research for you, and I can show you something cool. So it's quite nice to now come back and essentially re-deliver the first blog I ever did. Even though I say this as if it was a long time ago, it was February. <laughs> so I've, I've been doing a lot of these since then, but it all comes back to uh, fear. And um, we'll get through the obligatory slides so we can get to the important stuff. And for me, it was, it was really good because there is something really novel and interesting about what fear does and how they went about it. And particularly for myself, because my research background is in sort of evolutionary algorithms, but I also looked at automated planning systems, which is by and large going to be the focus of today's talk. And there was a, still at the time a sort of significant issue about whether or not planning could be used in games. And we were sort of arguing this point um, within the academic community and also in the games industry. And a lot of my actual early research is, uh, when I was a PhD student was looking at whether or not you could introduce planning in games to do interesting things with characters. Now, the funny thing is that um, Fear and also a number of other titles essentially answered my PhD topic while I was doing it. I'd sort of addressed it as a relevant issue and I did a bit of work in the area. But then the Fear Trilogy and also a couple other games that have cropped up since have by and large proven what I thought in the first case was we can use planning in games. So it's kind of nice to be proven right and have no involvement in it whatsoever and also for it to happen while you're in the middle of doing your PhD to the point it almost negates the work you did. Thanks a bunch. But um, no, I mean, in all seriousness, it's really awesome to see. But <clears throat> before we get into all the the hows and what have you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the game itself. So show of hands, how many people have actually played any part of the Fear Trilogy? Some of you. How many people have no idea what this is about? Good, good, good. So I will, I've prefaced it with a rather creepy picture. Um, it's a horror slash shooter game. Uh, so I will warn you about that beforehand. Uh, the young girl who you can see in the picture is called Alma. She is actually the chief antagonist of the game who seems to spend more time scaring the living daylights out, out of you than actually confronting you directly. So it's a series of first-person shooters that started back in 2005, and it's made by Monolith Productions, who'd previously worked on titles such as No One Lives Forever and Shogo, which I was actually a big fan of. Shogo was this kind of weird little first-person shooter game where you ran around inside a mech, but more like sort of the anime-style mechs. And you could jump out it, I think, also and go on foot. And there was all these little characters that would run around in the streets. Tiny little characters running around trying to shoot you or trying to run away. And you're running around in your mech going, ha, 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 bang, bang, bang. Shooting them all. It was awesome. Um, <clears throat> so fear was actually received well, you know, critically. And, you know, in a sales perspective, they did several expansions to the original fear. Um, until about four years later, along came uh, fear two. Now... I've actually put together the trailer from Fear 2, 
as well as Fear 1 in here, just to give you a feel for what the game's like and also how it's matured a little bit over time. The interesting thing is it's the only one with a subtitle because you might not know this, even if you are a fan of the game, that originally it wasn't going to be called Fear 2 because Monolith and I think it was Warner Brothers Games who are the producers were having a bit of a tiff over the IP rights. Who actually owned the rights to the name Fear? So when Monolith decided that they were going to go ahead and work on the sequel to the game, they said, we're making the sequel and it's going to be a continuation of the story even though we don't own the rights. And they asked the fans to help give a name to the game. And uh, it was voted as Project Origin, which is actually a reference to the kind of screwed up um, science experiment which takes place in the first game. So when they actually they, they kind of solved their differences and they were allowed to use the Fear title, they then gave it the subtitle Project Origin. Lastly, uh, Fear 3, which released in 2011. It does say it was developed by Day One Studios, and that is the case. However, it was overseen by Monolith, given it was sort of their baby, and they wanted to see it to its completion. Sadly, I've never actually played the third one. I've played one. I've, I've finished both one and two. I haven't got round to playing three yet. It's on that, you know, you, you know how it is. You've got that list of Steam games, and you go, I'm going to play them at some point. And then all that happens is they get caught under more Steam games. So there's, I think there's like several like part threes in series that I've never got around to playing. Fear 3, Mass Effect 3, Dead Space 3, Bioshock Infinite, which is, I guess, the third one in the series. Um, there seems to be a recurring pattern, actually. I should probably sort that out. Um, but anyway, let's, let's focus more on the talk itself. It's been hailed largely for its use of non-player character AI and the techniques that it uses behind it. And subsequently, um, while Fear has maybe not been as big as many other shooters in, the, in that genre, it's actually had a bigger impact on a lot of other games in that genre than many other, and that's driven largely by its AI systems. So, I'm going to play the trailer for first Fear 1, which is not the best of quality because it's back dated from 2005, and then we'll have the trailer from Fear 2, just to give you an idea of what it looks like in a more modern context. I will warn you, it does get a little bit creepy, so try not to scare the living daylights out of each other um, while it's playing. The scariest part, we don't know what reading is going to be. <laughs> right, and let's just get straight in and we'll show the other trailer. And there we go, we've got the trailers out of the way.
Now, given most, maybe you haven't actually feared Alma enough to actually fear her again, but if you've never played it, the original idea is about <clears throat> you are part of this team. FEAR actually stands for First Encounter Assault Recon, and it's a special ops unit that gets sent into spooky situations. Think like the Ghostbusters meets, you know, the A-team. Sort of. That's, I think that's a great example, actually. I'm going to keep that for something else. And <clears throat> you get sent in after... Uh, it's a military experiment that's gone awry, and in the first game, it's about a character called Paxton Fettel, who's now taken control of an army of um, soldiers that can be controlled using psychic commands. <clears throat> and by and large, that's who you fight in the game. However, something else is going wrong along the way, and it seems to continually manifest itself as a creepy little girl in a red dress who just walks up every now and then, and everything goes to hell, things go on fire, there's blood everywhere, and people start dying. And you realise that it's actually the product of a really horrendous experiment that they've been doing to this one woman over a period of about 20 years. Uh, but she's developed these massive psychic abilities, and she's broke free, and she's finally had enough. And it's sort of the manifestation of our psychic abilities are now wreaking havoc throughout the game. Now, before we really look at fear itself, I was, I was interested, I was thinking, well, what about shooter AI in general? Like, what, what's the way to go about this? Is there some sort of formula to getting this sort of thing right? And, you know, the, what are the core elements? And I was, I was thinking about this a lot um, in preparation for this talk. What are the key things that everyone would consider to be kind of crucial for an AI character in a shooting game? And there's a lot of resources that I can look at in order to conclude that. I mean, everybody would sort of gravitate towards Call of Duty, um, Halo, not my, quite my thing, but I appreciate a lot of people quite like it. Um, Battlefield as well, which I think is gradually depreciating in quality the longer it goes on. Um, but, you know, the first person shooter is arguably the most popular genre in gaming. And there's a lot of other examples that immediately cropped up off the top of my head. You know, naturally, well, we've got Borderlands there in the background. You've got, even most recently, Respawn's uh, uh, Call of Duty clone that's actually better than Call of Duty, Titanfall. You've got Killzone, Left 4 Dead, and Far Cry, which are, in fact, very good examples of AI applied within uh, shooting games. But also Crisis, which I would say is a, a good honourable mention as well, because they put a tremendous amount of effort into their AI. Um, Doom 3, but also more recently, its other release, Wolfenstein The New Order, which has some... Uh, overall, I really enjoyed it. I think the AI is lacking in some areas, but it's quite fun. Uh, Bioshock or System Shock, if, you know, if those of you who actually remember when you know, Ken Levine was making games before Bioshock. Um, even <clears throat> Medal of Honor, if we're going to bring in Call of Duty. Not the current one, which is kind of rubbish, but the fact that, of course, Call of Duty is just a Medal of Honor clone. And, you know, if I'm really, really desperate, I'll dig out Aliens Colonial Marines, which some of you may know had some of the worst AI on release um, from any first-person shooter in recent memory, to the point that it ended up getting bounced around on the internet a little bit about just how appalling it was. I got around to playing it. I didn't think it was that bad. Sure, the game wasn't great, but certainly I've seen worse. The thing is, there's not really any real consensus on how to do shooter AI. And a lot of them like to just use the bullet sponge tactic, where you've got an enemy who just takes an enormous amount of damage, and it continues to just sort of dish out punishment to you, and you're having to kind of like hide behind cover and run out every now and then, hit it with a rocket launcher and hope that did a little bit of damage. Some of them actually do try really hard with their AI. And a mention, an honorable mention, particularly to Halo, Killzone and Crisis. Halo in particular, we will come back and talk, to, talk about at a future talk. Killzone, I will mention by the end of this one. Now, the thing is, as in somebody with, as an enthusiast of AI in general, given I'm an AI researcher, developer, and somebody who plays games, it's became increasingly frustrating to watch because AI, with the exception of maybe these honorable mentions, isn't really the focus anymore. People aren't really interested in developing the AI up because it's all about the multiplayer. And there's certain franchises that completely avoid doing even half-decent AI in their campaign modes um, because their focus is on the multiplayer. And if they do talk about the campaign, they try and embellish it in like, the most ridiculous of ways. We didn't want Call of Duty to be just another Call of Duty game. So we made a game about men with shotguns who are emotionally attached to each other on a professional level. And now let's talk about the groundbreaking story. America's in trouble. And guns. Look at dogs! Look at dogs! 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 Forget all 
the socks from Modern Warfare 3. Yeah, oh, shit! Bright dogs! Bright ones! In college, you you're going to form a meaningful emotional relationship with this dog, will you? It's probably going to get shot to pieces during an elaborate cutscene. You don't care about dogs? Whatever. How about hairy arms, eh? Whoa. Whoa. Explosions! Yeah, we're not really interested in the AI, are we? And then when they do decide to talk about the AI... They also added an AI system to it, so they have fish move out of the way when you get close to Call of Duty Ghosts wasn't even that good anyway. Campaign in it was rubbish. Hated that fucking dog. Particularly if you ever got far enough into it where well, there's the mission you have to carry the damn dog. <sighs> I wish it actually had been cut to pieces in an elaborate cutscene. I wouldn't have had to carry the fucking thing. Um, anyway, Call of Duty aside, I think that there are kind of four key elements to what makes some good first person shooter AI. And I realise there's something of an irony in that I've got. Battlefield 4 as the backdrop to this particular slide, given that I don't think Battlefield 4 achieves any of these points. First of all, it has to be dynamic. I think characters have to react to changes in the environment. If you destroy something, if you eliminate their cover, they will re react to that. If you try and even shoot at them, they will react to that and they will try and do something about it. They need to be coordinated, that they actually talk to each other. They come up with some sort of tactic. One of them may attempt to flank you from one side. They'll actually tell each other what's going on. That way they can act accordingly. I mean, what are they doing even when they're not attacking you? When they're hiding behind cover? Are they doing anything interesting? Is there some sort of communication taking place? Are they continually moving around to better cover just to ensure their own longevity? Despite the fact they're not even bothering to attack you yet. They realise that's not the main thing. Even outside of combat. What do they do outside of combat? Do they wander around the environment? Do they interact with things? That's kind of interesting. More importantly, I think they should be um, difficult to fight against, but still fallible. You want them to be cool enough that you kind of fight against them, and you go, ah, oh, this is actually really, really neat, but at the same time, I can mow them down with a little bit of skill, a bit of ability. Because um, at the end of the day, after all, a bad guy in a first-person shooter campaign is there to die. Except for the, the main bad guy who, according to Call of Duty, will only die in the last 30 seconds of the campaign in a slow-motion sequence, which usually results in you having to do a quick-time event followed by spamming a button. In every other series, you just, you just shoot them. Sorry, I spent some of the weekend playing Advanced Warfare. <clears throat> so, I think that fear actually achieves all of this, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how Monolith pulled it off, and it brought a couple of innovations to the scene. And I talked already a bit about planning, and that is actually one of the big things that introduced. But the notion of building dynamic goals and allowing characters to have their own goals in real time and then acting accordingly. Similarly, they actually have a number of individual behaviors that they can execute in order to solve a particular problem. There's not always the one way to solve a problem. Now, I will say that I'd say fear and Halo are probably the two biggest influences, excuse me, on a lot of the kind of current state of first-person shooters. But the solution to fear was surprisingly quite simple. Um, what they created was this algorithm called goal-oriented action planning. And this has been quite heavily documented by Jeff Orkin, who was the develop one of the lead developers on fear at the time. He subsequently went off and completed his PhD at MIT um, after the completion of Fear. And does a lot of work in creating playable experiences nowadays. He's really interested in the notion of building AI that can create really cool experiences for players and games. But after going away and doing a whole bunch of research, he decided that the whole thing would just be a star search and a finite state machine. And you think, is that it? Hmm. Seems a little bit bland, almost. You can, I came in here, I'm sat down here at this time of night to be told it's A-star and an FSM, what the hell? Particularly the final years who know exactly what I'm talking about, going, is that it? Really? Yeah. 
Yeah and no. What's, what you're about to see because, um, is actually a little bit hard to process the first time you see it. Because they did a lot of really smart design um, in building both the FSM and the A-Star Search. And I'm going to focus more on the FSM and how that works. Now, for those of you who don't know what A-Star is, and I realise that there's maybe a couple of people who don't, it's an informed search algorithm. And it's sort of like the vanilla search algorithm that exists in AI and is used quite heavily in the games industry, largely because it works. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And A-Star is used in a large number of games because the thing is, it's also a very easy algorithm to optimise if you're using the likes of C and C++. And I have it on good authority that the A-Star search that was implemented uh, for fear um, was apparently really, really good to the point that it was used for every aspect where it required any sort of search, whether it was in the goal-oriented action planning method, whether it was the pathfinding, it all used the same A-star because they did such a good job of optimizing it, it was super fast. Now, if you don't know what A-star is, it relies on two things, because the algorithm is designed to make the best decision it possibly can based upon what it knows. It's a very simple AI algorithm in that respect. It figures out from every action that it can take how expensive that action is. Now, we would think, if you think about it as a navigation problem, the cost of that might be the energy it takes you to travel the distance, but also the distance you have to travel. That's a reasonable assumption to make. Um, but also it considers what's called a heuristic. And that's like a rough guess. If you're moving from one location to another, from point A to point B, and you're trying to head to point D in the distance, you'd, dis you'd consider whether or not to go from point A to B based on how much it costs you to get from A to B. But B will have this kind of rough guess. It's like, I think I'm roughly this far away from your goal. And that's what the heuristic's doing. It's going, I think roughly about that far away. And that's a kind of, just, that rule of thumb is enough to kind of help spur the algorithm along and get it close to the goal, um, provided it underestimates where it is. So if you're giving a rough guess and it underestimates what, it sh what the actual cost is, usually that works out to be a really good solution, surprisingly how effective that is. And finite state machines, now I talked about these previously in the Arkham Intelligence talk. Very simple enough, a symbolic representation of uh, computation within a system. You have this series of states, and in a state you can be doing something while you're in it, and you wait inside that state until a particular event occurs and you transition over to another state. Now, when I was talking about this in the Arkham Intelligence talk, I was having to infer a lot of what I was, I, was in, I was thinking about. Like, how did they actually do this? How was it built? And I came up with some ideas of what it looked like, but at the end, and I figured you could abstract it to something even simpler, but I didn't know for sure because Rocksteady have never made it public knowledge. Jeff Orkin did um, when he gave a GDC talk, I think it was in 2006. And I'm not gonna tell you the title of it yet because it defeats the purpose of this slide transition. The talk was called Three States and a Plan, the AI of Fear. That's not it abstracted. That's not me reducing their finite state machine. That's the whole thing. Each character in the game, whether it's the biggest of grunts to the rats that scurry around the sewers, all use the same system. And that is it. Three simple states. One that tells it to go to a location, one to play an animation, and one to use a smart object. Now, a smart object would usually be a node that was attached somewhere in the level to something of interest, like a table or a chair, or it might be like a filing cabinet. Um, it can also be things like barrels. So anything that, was, that you could interact with was considered a smart object. In fact, it's redundant. There's actually an element of redundancy because a smart object the only thing you had to do was play an animation. So it's actually two states. That's it. The whole thing. Go to locations, play animations, because you could consider that the use smart object state is essentially a fancy animation state. Now the key thing that you can see here is those edges. Because it's slightly different in that I don't have any transitions built into the FSM by default. If you look at that there, I didn't put any up. There's no indication of what would cause a transition from the go-to to the animate state. Now, if you were doing this, maybe if you're actually hard coding a very complex finite state machine, 
for a particular problem, I would know exactly what events would cause that transition because I need to be able to debug it. In this case, there isn't. Because instead, the A star search navigates the finite state machine. It tells the FSM what states to be in when, and then tells it what state to move into. It then tells it, when it goes into a particular state, what the parameters are of that state. So, for example, if the A star says, I want you to transition into the go-to state, and I want you to go specifically to this location. Now, when it's doing go-to, it then knows to use the A star to do the pathfinding to that location. Then it would say, OK, now when you get to that location, I want you to do an animation and it would tell it which animation to play. Now, that means that we had to figure out in real time the parameters for when it transitioned into each state, what the parameters were that it was going to use and execute when it was in that state. So how do you manage that sort of problem? And what we need to do is model the current state of the world. Now, We've talked a little bit about this before, that you always need to know what state you're in. And the state allows us to model, on a, very, on a computationally tractable sense, what's happening. And typically, we model using just simple variables. What my x, y, z position is in the world, um, how much health I've got left, how much ammo I've got left in my gun. These are the sort of things in my state I would model. The thing is that that's not going to help us achieve tactical thinking, kind of more abstract thinking. It's all right for navigation, because if it's X, Y, Z, and then I say with every action I move maybe a certain number of units on one or more of those axes, I can then say, well, based upon that action, I know where I'm going to be in the future, and then you can gradually glue together a path of the navigation. It's not ideal, but it works. But that's not going to help us to do all the kind of cool AI that they actually implemented in FIA. So Monolith went for something a little bit more advanced, and the technical term for it is automated planning and scheduling. And what we're doing is we're actually modeling the world in a far more abstract sense. And this is going to make a lot more sense to you, hopefully, in a couple of slides. Because the first couple, of, first couple of minutes when you hear this, you go, what? As soon as I start showing really simple examples, you go, oh, this actually makes a tremendous amount of sense. Huh. Why didn't we start with this in the first place, Tommy? God damn it. Now, it's, planning is focused on long-term decision making and sort of abstracts the world to a point where we're no longer thinking about granular behavior. So instead of having you know, decisions like we're going to move left, we're going to move right, I'll move forward, I'll move backward, that's, that's far too low level. It's far too granular. We're going to spend a tremendous amount of CPU time just computing simple navigation, which isn't really of much use to us. So we kind of scrub them. And let's start thinking about it on a more kind of long-term deliberative sense. What about taking cover? That could be an action. Taking cover, but, but the thing is that taking cover is a little bit more complex because we're having to think about whether or not a piece of cover is accessible, whether or not it's near to us. Um, can I then move towards that piece of cover? Move into a particular location. Now, I'm not even thinking about the pathfinding that's involved in that. I'm just saying I want to move to that location, but I don't want to think about it in the sense of an XYZ coordinate. I maybe think, I mean, I'm currently in lecture hall B301. I might decide I want to move to B302. But then that depends upon the connectivity of the world. I could actually move to the corridor outside on B3. So that there would be the south B3 corridor. I could say I could move to that corridor. And given that there's a connectivity between that corridor and B302, I could then move into B302. Of course, there's a lot of actual physical distance between me moving from this lecture theatre to the one on the other side of the building, but I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the kind of high-level thinking of, well, if I want to get into that building, I've got to come out, of, come out of, go to that room, I've got to come out of this room, and then from that corridor, I go in the other room. I'm not really focusing too much on the kind of low-level complications. Climbing ladders. I'm not interested in climbing each particular step of the ladder. I'm just thinking, I'm at the bottom of the ladder, I want to be at the top. Cool. And then when I get to the top of the ladder, I can do something else. Flanking an enemy. Now, flanking an enemy, if you think about it in a kind of contextual sense, is actually a movement. It's moving to a particular location. But, I'm in, but this location is, being, is contextual with respect to where the player is. So I'm thinking about things in a far more uh, abstract and almost tactical level here, which is kind of cool. 
Now, uh, Fear did it using a method called strips. Now, strips um, was actually, it's a funny thing, because strips is often used to refer to the planning language that it is, but it actually comes from the system that first adopted it, which is the Stanford Research Institute Problem Solver. It built, when, when they were actually developing the strips system, they built the language to go with it. And, you know, it's quite an innovative problem-solving AI system, really useful for building into modern, you know, video games of 2005 and further on, except, you know, it was built in 1971. First ever paper published on this strips, a new approach to the application of theorem proving to problem solving by Richard Fikes and Niels Nielsen in 1971. We finally got around to using it in games, but 30 odd years later. So this all kind of comes back to the earlier point I was making that we've been talking for a while about planning in games would be kind of cool because we've been able to do planning now for over 40 years, but it's only been in games for less than a decade. So it's kind of interesting that this is why it was such a big deal in that this is the first significant effort by someone to put a planning system into a game and it actually worked. And the strips, this is actually the simplest strips example I could think of to show off in a room. <clears throat> what we do is we use a set theoretic logic where I'm actually express, expressing everything in English and what we do is we actually have variables that tell me a little bit about what's going on. Now, this has broken up the problem. This is the simplest of problems I could think of. It's the, on the top, we actually have the problem. And on the bottom, we have the domain model that we have, to be fair. So the initial state, which is the starting state of this problem, tells me everything I need to know. I'm at some location A. And I know that there's another location B, which is adjacent to location A. My goal is to get from A to B. So that doesn't sound too hard, right? All I've got to do is find a way to get from A to B. And I've already told you that they're next to each other. If you think about A is here and B is there, all I've got to do is make one step to my left and I'm in the adjacent location. So, <coughs> excuse me. In order to do that, we provide actions. And actions tell us this is the only way you can change the state of the world. And there's one action, and it's called move by God. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Now, move allows me to move between two locations, X and Y. Now, every action that you have in a planning problem has two key components. The preconditions, which are the facts that have to be true before I try and do the action, and the postconditions, which is what are the facts that will be true after I completed the action. So the preconditions of moving from X to Y make a tremendous amount of sense. One, I have to be in X, because what's the point in trying to move from somewhere I'm not actually in? That's kind of deep, actually. I move, but I'm not really there. Um, but also that the two locations are adjacent to one another. I mean, this is like trying to say, I want to leave this room and go to another room on the other side of the campus. Well, they're not physically next to each other, and last time I checked, I can't teleport. I did check. It hurt a little bit. So that makes sense. Okay, fair enough. If I want to move from here to that hallway, okay, so those two locations are next to each other. Now, I don't have to worry about the physical space. It doesn't matter that the corridor's quite small and it's, you know, 30, 40 feet in that direction and that this is one massive lecture theatre. It doesn't matter. All we know is there's a connectivity between these two locations. There is an adjacency between that corridor and this room. And then the post conditions are once you've completed the action, it means that you're no longer in the location you were in and you're now at the location you were going to. That makes sense, right? Not that hard. Now, the thing is, we can then model far more complex problem spaces in English. And that's really cool. Now, Strips isn't the only one that does this. In fact, Strips has been sort of um, been replaced, by and large, within the automated planning community by something called PDDL, which is the Planning Domain Description Language, 
And PDDL, I would argue, is a lot more flexible and um, more interesting as a language because we get to do a lot more in terms of temporal effects and looking at fluence and actually being able to carry information um, between, uh, so carrying like certain numeric values. So I, can, I always know how much ammo I've got left. And then I can actually do an action of like filling up my ammo. As I do this, there may be like a gradual increase of the amount of ammo I've got at a certain number of rounds per second, because I'm kind of picking up ammo and stuffing it into a bag. And it tells me then that this is how much ammo you're gaining per second. It takes X amount of seconds to fill the bag. So this is what more expressive programming, like uh, planning languages do, but strips is more than sufficient for this type of problem. <clears throat> and in fact, the team at Monolith, if I recall correctly, did actually introduce fluence into their build of strips. So <clears throat> what they needed was to have a series of goals and actions that their characters could have. And so this is actually taken directly out of one of their editors that they built for building their AI systems. And you can see that the AI goals you know, are quite interesting. They can guard, kill enemies, dodge, go to cover, or try and ambush someone. Similarly, their actions can be a range. And there's, there's a lot of different things that they're doing here. Idle, going to attack, um, going to a particular location, dodging to a cover, blind fire from cover. And all of these require like, maybe multiple animations taking place at once. But we're no longer thinking on the granular level. We're able to think more tactically. And this is where particularly the characters in the game can get far more interesting. So what they would do is they would craft each potential action they were going to use in the strips language. Now, the strips actions, so what we saw there is here's all the actions that you can achieve. Blind fire from cover, going to nodes, melee attacks. Thing is, that these all required you to use the FSM. So going to node would require you to use the go-to state of the FSM. In fact, everything, everything else required the animation state or using the smart object state. So what it's doing is the planning system is telling it on what it would do is it would actually figure out what a plan is that it wants to achieve. And I'll talk about why it actually picks its plans in a little bit. And it says, right, I want to <coughs> go behind cover. There's a table over there. I want to flip the table over, use it as cover. But when you do that, I want you to move towards that location and just spray from the hip against the player just to keep them preoccupied. That actually results in three different states being used in that finite state machine. So it would start by saying you need to go to that location. So it would actually get to a certain point. Now, the thing is, it could be going to one particular location, maybe behind cover, and then it says, right, now when you go from there to there, run the hip fire animation. So it would then be firing at you as it ran across. Then it says, okay, you finished that action. The next action in the plan is to flip the table over. And that was actually the use smart object. Now, flipping the table requires you to use a particular animation, which is all done within that state. So it goes, okay, it flips the table over, and then it goes into cover. So every action that it has tells it what state it needs to be into and what parameters it requires in order to do it. But the thing is, we are not considering it as play animation of uh, jumping behind cover. We are modeling it as an action which just says, get to cover. So we get to think, when we're debugging it, it actually makes life a lot easier because you're only thinking about it in a kind of tactical sense than anything else. So. While we look at it at first and go, oh, it's just three states in a finite state machine, meh, that's not particularly exciting. What's really cool is that that's not the intelligent part of the system. The intelligent part comes from realizing it needs to come up with a plan and planning towards that, and then it actually executes that plan from within that finite state machine. So in some respects, it's actually really, really cool. And the search process of how to navigate through this state transition system where we're taking the strips actions and going, okay, I'm in this state, I apply that strips action, I end up in this state, and then I apply that strips action, I end up in this state. Oh, and that's the goal I want to be in. That search process is done by the A-star search. So with a bit of strips modeling, an A-star and a finite state machine, they pretty much reinvented first-person shooter AI, with the exception of Halo.
because Halo was also doing its own cool thing elsewhere. The other cool thing that I actually really liked about this is that it allowed them to decouple the behaviours from individual characters. Because they decided, well, what if I want a certain character to be able to do certain actions, but I don't want it to be able to do others? Because that these were unique strips, domain pro um, files that were being built for each type of character, they'd simply add or remove them whenever they wanted. But all of them were reliant upon exactly the same system. So the rats that you see in the, some of the warehouse levels and in the sewer, which is by and large in the opening hour or so of the game, um, they have pretty much one type of goal, or two, I think it's dodge and cover. And the only actions they have is to go to nodes. They have no real expressivity. I'd be a little bit, I'd be a little bit panicked if like, a rat is able to do a dodge roll than a melee attack. It's a different kind of game entirely. But they can do it. But the thing is, if they wanted, they could have implemented it. And all I said, okay, we just need to put the actions in, and then we'll just need to build the animations for that particular character, and job done. Sure, I, may, I, say, I you know, say that lightly. That's still a tremendous amount of work required to achieve that. But this was the cool thing, was they said, right, well, we maybe need... The heavier characters aren't allowed to do dodging actions. And all they do is just copy and paste the soldier's AI and then just remove certain actions from his action set. Job done. They don't even have to worry about animating it to score. So it was kind of cool that it's all running off exactly the same system, and then for each character, they just picked whatever goals and actions that they wanted it to use. It was really neat. So let's see it in action. Now, I've got two options, but I'm kind of biased towards a particular one. I've got a short clip that I put together last night, but I'd rather see someone try it out themselves. So who would like to have a go? Come on down, James. Let's do it. Now, this is, a, this is a mouse and keyboard effort. It doesn't run on game pads, I'm afraid. Let me just start recording, because this is going to go in the final version. <sighs> right. Can you, in, can you uninvert the mouse? Yes, we can uninvert the mouse. There's always that one guy. Except I think I'm the one guy right, in this case. Nope, 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 nope. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> now that's the interesting thing, because there is... I'll let you sit down first before we get started. There is actually a, a mechanic in the game which allows you, to, allows you to slow down. It's like kind of slow motion. <laughs> which I think is actually there in place to help make the AI a little bit easier. It, doesn't, it seems out of place. I think maybe everyone would just been sitting watching The Matrix a bit too much. And we're like, yeah, man, that's what I want in my game. But uh, I've saved it at a particular point, so if you can survive this part, feel free to then move through the level towards the next part, because there's one or two uh, soldier incursions in the remainder of this chapter. But bearing all this in mind, what we'll do is we'll have a little look and see what it's actually doing. And of course, you know, I hope you do well, but at the same time, I'm more interested in watching the AI kick your ass. So you're about to walk in to an area where there's several AI patrolling. So just be careful. There's one already, he'll be round the corner, but he should have his back to you. Okay, there's one guy there. There's another guy outside patrolling. Now, what's the way to do this? Went for the melee. Good start. Now, they're going to start looking for you soon. There you go. Oh, they realize something's up. Nicely done. Notice how he yelled. He actually told everybody where you are. Before he died, of course. Snuck up on you pretty quickly there. Fortunately, you were doing well. Even then, you can see in the bottom corner, I've kept the subtitles on, that they're communicating with each other. They're asking them to check in. And then if one of them sees you, he tells everybody else where you are. I 
think you're in the green. I don't think there's... Oh, no, no. One left. He's looking for you. <clears throat> He's waiting. Where is he? Ooh. Where'd he go? Damn it! The hunt is on. The hunt is on, indeed. <laughs> Now, this is the bit that always creeps me out the most is when they disappear. Because I know they're somewhere. They actually start instigating patrolling patterns. But I haven't really talked about how that happens yet. I'll start telling you shortly. Let's see if you can make a break for it. Just leave them alone and we'll just head off somewhere else. Unless you're determined to kill it. Uh, Area secure? I don't think so, mate. I like it. You're both hunting for each other and can't find one another. This is glorious. <laughs> this is like a dream demo. <laughs> he's watching you. He's probably just sitting in a corner and just like, yeah. Tell you what, make a break for it. If he's not going to come around, you should just head to the next location. Yeah. All right. To head through this door here. I think there's like mildly creepy bit, nothing too exciting. And then we'll have another incursion because there'll be more troops lying around. I mean, we'll hear them talk to each other before anything really happens. Creepy noises. Someone's played this game before. <laughs> I was actually playing it yesterday. So. <laughs> Have you been preparing, hoping upon hope, that I would ask you to play? No, but to be fair, it was pretty lucky. Get some grenades. Oh, it'll be good. In future, we should try, try throwing a grenade at one of them and see how they react. Because um, if they get enough time, they will react to it. They tend to run away. They tend to run away if they get a chance. Unless you use a grenade and it hits them directly. In which case, they don't get a chance to react. Because <laughs> I think they're impact grenades. You just sort of just go up. Oh, he's throwing a grenade. going there's a little bit more before we get to a creepy bit at the end of this chapter so you can push through see how far you can get you're gonna have one or two more incursions but they're responding they're responding to the environment when you throw a grenade at them they shout that in fact when they were throwing a grenade they told their teammates they were throwing a grenade now I thought I'm kind of I kind of wish I hadn't turned the difficulty down You're fine, keep going. We'll have somebody who hasn't played the game before come out and try it next. There we go. So we're kind of got a bit of a reprieve at the moment, but they are responding to what's happening around them. They're actually communicating with one another in order to execute certain types of actions. But also, they don't seem quite often, actually, when they're being killed, they tend to be trying to run to cover. It's very rare that they seem to go directly for the player and try and attack them outright, unless they're feeling kind of confident.
He's even now responding to the fact that he's kind of doomed. <laughs> it's, <a bit> of <laughs> it's harsh. harsh. <laughs> Begin to figure out which player type in Bartle's taxonomy you fall into. <laughs> sure, he didn't have enough a chance to, you know, save himself, but at least he tried to acknowledge the fact of what was happening around them. And they probably did start trying to move to some safe area within the local proximity of the grenade. Of course, no real chance of actually achieving that. I'm kind of grateful we showed your footage, because if I remember right in my video, um, I got a headshot with a grenade on one of them. <laughs> you watch our group. <laughs> it was glorious. <laughs> so one of them's declared he's seen him. The rest of them have all gone to cover. He's still trying to get to cover. He wasn't fast enough. He's now dead. There's at least two more. I just realised I've got the same screen as Kilburn One. Oh, the more than. Oh, there's three left. There we go. So every couple of seconds or so. Every couple of seconds or so, they're replanning. They're figuring out what their goal is. I'm going to talk about the goals in a minute. And then they're coming up with a series of actions to try and find a way out of their particular problem. But in this case, they are no might, no chance for the might of the player. Awesome. Shall we get to see some creepy stuff and then we'll finish off this chapter? And this happens periodically throughout the game if you've not played it before, that you, you keep having these like psychic flashes happening in front of you. But the game likes to break it up between scary bit, shooting bit, scary bit, shooting bit. Bloody bit. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you very much. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. I think that was well done. Alrighty. So, back to that whole talk thing I'm doing. There we go. So that was a nice mix of when we got to actually see the, the AI reacting to what was happening during play, but also that still at the end of the day they're quite beatable, but at least they're interesting. And I think that if you go back to what I said at the start of the talk, I think that they achieve all of these points, that they are dynamic, they're responding to the player and his actions. We heard this when they're yelling that there's a grenade incoming. They try to get to cover, nine times out of ten they don't. Um, they'll also tell each other to go into cover, which is kind of tying into the second point that they're coordinated. They're actually listening to each other, which is really cool. They're actually making a legitimate effort to attack the player, but also they seem to value their own life. They get into cover. They don't do this annoying Call of Duty thing where they sort of sit behind a piece of cover and go, shit me here. And then 10 seconds later, shit me here. No, okay. <laughs> How about now? They're moving around, and sometimes they do something that's a bit silly. They decide to run out, and they'll try and shoot at me. Of course, the player is, at this point, unbeatable, and you mow them down. But they'll, kind of, they'll take their chances every now and then. Um, even then, we saw sometimes they're doing patrols, they're talking to each other, even when they don't realise where the player is at this point. Now, they still die. 
but they're at least challenging enough that they make it interesting. I'm not just having to run out and play sort of Call of Duty or Serious Sam style, where you just stand in front of everybody with a giant minigun and just mow everything down. I'm having to think a little bit more when I'm fighting against them. But it's a little bit more than just the strips in the A-star to make this happen. In fact, it comes down to some rather clever design. So I was thinking, well, what are the goals for this dynamic behavior? How do we achieve this type of behavior? What's well, based around the goals, but what are the goals? We'll talk about that. How are they communicating with one another? How are they actually coordinated? And that, to me, is one of the best tricks that this game plays. And why are they making these decisions? And how do we kind of keep that challenge up? And that ties pretty much down to the goals and their teamwork. So the goals of the agent are really simple. Um, and it all just ties around minimizing threat. Now, it's a really interesting point to make, is to minimize threat rather than to kill the player, because you'd think they're the same thing, but they're not. Because you would think, oh, well, it's a bad guy in a game, so his job is just to kill the player. Well, no, these characters like to minimize the threat presented to them. And that means they can do a variety of different actions. And some of these could involve trying to kill the player, but a lot of the time it doesn't. So we could think about attacking the player, so I could try and shoot from behind cover, I could try blind fire, I can try throwing grenades, I can melee attack. Other times, the, my actions actually might be, well, let's just try and get to cover. I could either run to the cover, maybe take a shot at the player as I'm doing it, I could dive behind cover, jump through a window. Um, they'll maybe try and jump away from a grenade because they recognize that a grenade is there. And just watch out for any other random events that might hurt you. Sometimes there's environmental things that you can do to kill them. They might be aware of these, they might not. So that is pretty much the whole thing that builds the planning system. It just goes, right, minimize your threat at this given point. They will then try and figure out a plan to do so. And they realize, well, actually, the best way to minimize my threat right now, because I'm standing in front of the player, the player has got his sights right on my head. This is not good. I'm going to take a pot shot at him, but I'm going to be running to cover while I do it. So it makes a plan to run to the nearest piece of cover, but fires at the player as it's doing it. It's now behind cover. Its threat's been minimized, but not removed overall. The only way to remove the threat entirely is to kill the player. So in time, it will then go, OK, it's now no longer that big a threat to me to attack him from behind cover. So I'll try and pop out and take a shot. Meanwhile, we could have some teamwork going on where, as I'm attacking him, there's a character flanking around the side. So, getting to this point, how do squads work as teams? And this is, to me, one of the, my favorite things about how the AI in this game works. It doesn't work together at all. And you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute. How do they not know? I mean, they don't know what each other's doing. Eh? What? But we saw them responding to what each other's doing. They don't talk to each other either. But we saw them talking to each other. We saw them responding to the fact that they're talking to each other. One of them tells them a grenade's coming in. He tries to respond to that fact. One of them tells the, tells the other one to get to cover. He then goes into cover. What we didn't see, but you can see in the game if you play it, is they'll tell him to flank. And they will flank accordingly. He goes flank left, and he will then flank to the left of the player. And then you've got to kind of respond to that going, oh, shit, he's about to flank me. You pull around to the other side and kill that guy while you've still got a spare chance. But none of that is actually done by teamwork. But the illusion of teamwork still exists. And this is, this is without a doubt, my favorite thing. They're all actually working together, but none of them realize they do it because they don't know anything else about what's going on in the world with the exception of pretty much themselves and probably the player. That's about it. They don't really pay attention to the fact that there's other characters in the environment. So it does this really easily because the NPCs are managed into squads and there's a squad coordinator that manages each of these squads. Now the squads, the enrollment on a squad is based largely on proximity. If you're near a bunch of other characters, you're now part of that squad. And the squad manager will assign goals to that team based upon what's happening around them. The squad manager knows what's happening around them, and it will provide any of the information that they need. But it doesn't tell them, doesn't tell one particular NPC in that squad what somebody else in that squad is doing. 
So they have their own goals that they can assign themselves, but a squad system will tell them what goals they should be trying to achieve. And there's certain actions that are attached to those certain types of goals. And that's when they start to do what looks like tactical squad-based behaviour, but none of them realise they're doing it. And the interesting thing as well is that this, while the squad system will tell them what to do, it doesn't override their base instincts. So if the, if the AI knows that doing something that the squad commander has told it to do is actually a suicide mission, it backs out. Because it still places a higher priority upon itself than whatever its boss tells it to do. Which I think is really interesting. So here's an example that's been lifted out of Jeff Orkin's paper. And we've got two characters here, and they decide that they're going to flank the player. Decide. They're not going to flank. The, they're not deciding they're going to flank the player. The squad manager has told this one on the left to try and achieve a flank movement. And he does his search with A star using the strips model. And that particular goal has certain types of actions attached to it. And he goes, OK, so to achieve this, I need to move round to another side to that particular side. I'll pick this side of the player, and I'll go around on that direction. Then the squad manager tells the other one, OK, I want you to also do a flanking behavior. And it goes, OK. And it goes, can I go this way? It goes, no. That's taken. It's busy. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll take that point then. OK, do that then. And it paths round to that point. It uses the A star, using the strips, and it computes a plan to come round to this side. The two of them are completely oblivious to the fact of what each other's doing, but when you see it happen in real time, it looks like they're coordinated. And the player freaks out. You go, oh my god, they're talking to each other! Shit, 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 shit! Go into slow-mo and you start trying to shoot them all. Now this can apply to anything. If one character's hiding behind cover, and the other one is running away from the player and trying to find cover, it doesn't look to see if another character is behind a particular piece of cover. It asks the squad manager and it says, well, where's the nearest piece of available cover? And it goes, okay, well, you can't have that one over there because this guy's standing there. However, that one's free. Okay, cool. And then it will figure out its plan to get to that piece of cover. So the whole time, you will, you'll never see this circumstance where two of them are grouping up on the same piece of cover trying to hide together. Sometimes you'll see them both kind of huddled up because one's trying to achieve one action while another one's trying to get to another piece of cover, maybe further behind him. And then they sort of back into each other because they're both trying to achieve that, that, those separate plans at the same time. Which causes a bit of a problem for them because now they're kind of tripping over each other because they don't really acknowledge each other's existence. But by and large, most of the time when they're, when they're actually executing their plans, it looks as if they're working together. Conversely, this is some of the awesome stuff when I'm talking about the fact that they value their own life, here's a circumstance where the, the character on the left has, has, well, it seems like he's told the other one to flank. And the one on the right starts running towards the player to get to this piece of cover. However, the player threw a grenade at him. And this is where their base instincts kick in, because it goes, this is way too much threat. I should not be going this way. I've just went and started running in this direction. He's thrown a freaking grenade. I don't care what you've told me to do, I'm out of here. Because the base layer of its behavior, which dynamically comes up with goals to remove its threat, goes, oh shit, grenade! What's the immediate plan to get out of this? Back up, okay. <coughs> Boom. What were you saying again? Go to that point, okay. And now it hides behind cover. So you'll never end up with the AI stupidly running into, you know, running into a death trap because it wasn't paying attention to what was happening around it. Sure, it will occasionally run into you know, your line of sight and then you mow it down, but that's the whole point of the game. It, it thinks that the threat level there was you know, small enough that it could get away with it, which is kind of cool. So you, they don't end up with this weird circumstance where they just continually run to the same point of cover and you just keep throwing grenades and they just keep dying. It won't happen. They, will, they might die, but they will respond to the fact that there's a grenade there and try and avoid it beforehand. But my favorite bit is the dialogue, because you think when he says to him, you know, fire in the hole, because he's throwing a grenade, or watch out, grenade, or flank right, or telling one of them to get to cover. What happens is 
that there's an audio system that's built into the game. And sometimes a plan will result in an action. So there might be a plan that says, right, you need to get to cover immediately. Because you've just recognized that the player is there. Your dynamic goal system kicked in and went, oh shit, player! Starts planning in its head. Get to cover, get to cover now. So it comes up with a plan. That plan might, depending on the number of other characters in the room, say, oh yeah, and don't forget, play this bit of audio. Because there's other part, there's other people there. But it doesn't tell it that, it just goes, play the audio. But the squad manager goes, yeah, because there's other people here. You don't know that, but I know that. So play the audio, that way it looks as if you're talking to your friends. So when the player comes out and it goes, you know, contact, take cover, and it runs behind cover, and then you see everybody else run to cover, you go, oh, they're adapting. <laughs> Damn it. But also things like when one of them tell, tells the other one to flank. He's not telling the other one to flank because the decision to flank was made by the guy who's going to flank anyway. You think it's the other guy telling him, right, go flank him. What's happened is the guy on this side who's going to flank anyway said, I'm going to flank. I've decided my plan is to flank the player. I will now execute that plan. And the squad manager goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You're going to flank. Okay, right. We need to play that little bit of dialogue when you do that action that tells you to flank. Okay. So it tells the system to play the audio. And he starts the flank movement. But what's happening is that when it says, you know, when the audio system's kicking in to say, right, play that piece of dialogue, it picks any other character within proximity of him other than him who's actually executing the action. So the guy that's on the other side then says the line of dialogue. So as a result of his planning, he's came up with the dialogue for somebody else to say. But when it's executed in real time, you think one of them has told the other one to do something and then he has acted accordingly. First time you see it, I thought it was absolutely amazing. So, oh my God, they're talking to each other, they're communicating! And then you read the paper and go, oh. And you get a little bit upset. At the same time, I think it's really, really cool. Because, well, unless you're listening to this talk, or you've read the paper, or you've read my blog post on it. If you're just somebody who's playing the game, you don't really know why that happened, you just know it's cool. Oh, that was really awesome. It's like they're talking to each other and then he reacts to it accordingly. That's epic. I've, I'm kind of ruining all this by you turning up to these talks because you go, I know, how, I now know how it works. It's not as cool now. Because mm. all he's doing is he's decided that, he's, that he should say it. He's saying he figured out what the dialogue is and he told the other guy to go see it. That's not cool anymore. That's a bit boring. Nah, I think it's awesome. Well, you must think it's awesome, otherwise you wouldn't be here. It's a terrible pun. It's a terrible pun, I admit. But with that, we're pretty much finished with this talk. Does someone else want to have another go? We'll crank the difficulty up a little bit. Do you want to, oh, oh is, this, is this what it is? You, you want to redeem yourself after the, the Arkham talk? Oh, come on then. You do this one today, you're guaranteed to be the first person that plays at the Halo talk. Okay. <laughs> Done. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can, we're gonna load it back up where it was and then I'm gonna crank the difficulty up a little bit to make it interesting. <laughs> Are you an inverted or not inverted? Uh, tip, I mean, I am with controller, so I guess I would be with mouse. You are inverted, okay. You are, yes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then let's go into game controls, and let's crank the difficulty up a little bit. There we go. Place your beds. <laughs> so, same scenario again. Get your bearings first, try not to make everybody sick. a little sensitive for you. Okay, round two. Let's try doing it a bit differently. <clears throat> no. 
Are we feeling good? It's, uh, I think it's control. Shift. Shift. There we go. It doesn't even aim down the sights. This is your pre Call of Duty. All right, take him out. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, I gotta applaud that. I'm, I'm actually still quite impressed you got that far. So let's see how long it takes before somebody realises. We might be lucky and they don't even realise he's down. Uh oh. No, they figured it out. Because the squad manager at this point has told it that one of its characters is down and you need to go and find out. And it tells them they should go and patrol the location near the body. <laughs> and you got hit by a grenade. I said that guy was getting shot at Alright, just hit any key, it'll go back to the last save. Sorry? It's on the recording. Is it what? Recording. Yes. I turned it on before I started the game up. Yeah, that's your slow mo. Sorry, we meant to tell you what the button is for slow mo. to reload. Zed your health pack. You've got two of them, but you've still got plenty of health right now. Stop humping the crate. They're coming for you. <laughs> the AI's coming. We don't know where it is. My friend Matt is playing Civilization 5. Friend? <laughs> yes, I know. Friend's a bit of a loose term. Sorry, Matt. Um, Oh my god, you're like the god of the hip fire. <laughs> Press Z, there you go, you got a bit of health back. Are you sure you're inverted? Hiding? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, are you sure you're inverted? Well, why did he get that? Squad managers recognise that there's only two characters left and decide to play an animation to actually declare that to the player. So how many times are they saying something that just sounds like they're talking to each other, but it's there to give you information? They're going to cover. They're throwing grenades. There's only two of them left. They can see you. <laughs> right, let me just double check. No sudden movements. Yep, yep, still recording. We're good. Right. Do you want me to turn it down a little bit? Uh, if you want. <laughs> what about your mouse? Do you think the mouse is too sensitive? Uh, surprisingly, yeah. Oh, Jesus, I, it's barely on. I know. It's <laughs> so weird. Mouse, oh, right, okay, there's no sensitivity to it whatsoever. It'll be like you're dragging it through gravel. Do we invert the axis? Do you think we might be better off without it? We can try it without. All oh, right, we can try it without. I don't play many shoots on PC. There we go. Oh, God, that's awkward. <laughs> so we can hear them talking to each other about something that's already happened in the game, but that's just there to kind of add to the experience and what have you. OK, here we go. Round three. <laughs> Two down. This is going a lot better so far. I think messing around with the mouse controls has helped. I'd watch that right. I think they're going to come through the doorway on the right. Not because I've played this sequence too many times or anything. They're patrolling. Here we go. He's getting to cover. Now he's behind cover. He's trying to take an opportunity at the player. He thinks his threat's minimised. Sounds like either him or more have turned up. 
player is down again. I think I'd, be, I'd go on the offensive this time. Don't go on defensive. Run. Take him. Oh. So once again, they're patrolling. They're looking for you. They don't know exactly where you are. They might have a rough inclination. They're going to converge on that body. But now one of them's seen you. They all know where you are because the squad manager will tell them where to go. Continually planning, continually reacting to what's happening in the world around them. Holy crap, what was that? Did someone just shoot through the window? You gotta be careful, because sometimes not only will they jump through windows, they'll throw grenades through windows, because they know they can do that. Come on, you're doing well this time. Nearly done. Only a couple left, I think. Oh, he's seen you. He's gonna try and run to a nearby point. Oh, one of them is trying to flank around the side. Now, of course, the man down would have been caused by the fact that the character died, but then it finds somebody else to say the dialogue for him. I think you did it. Oh, no. Press Z, get your health up. Oh no, you've run out of health packs. Oh, he's throwing grenades. He killed himself, let's all pray. I think he might have. There's a health pack on that table. Press F to pick it up. There you go, and then hit Z, there you go. Thank God you had like a full clip there. <laughs> oh, right. We made it. So hopefully you can see when, the, when we're actually going through this, just regardless of our success, that they are, by all means keep playing, um, just head through that door, press F to open the door, um, that they are responding to changes in the environment. They are kind of coordinating because the squad <laughs> behavior works together to try and achieve several actions at the same time which are, in fact, intelligent, but they don't really realize that they're working together as this sort of collective unit. So you can walk through here. A scary thing happens, but it's not that scary. Yeah, I'd get that. That might come in handy. That extra 5%. Okay, watch out, coming through here. Stop messaging on, on uh, <laughs> it won't record that. I'm, I'm happy to say. I think, is he still out there? I don't know where he, th he threw the grenade through the window. Oh, no, he's still there. There's a window to your right on the other side of that crate. I think that's where he's hiding out. Down to pistols. <laughs> hang on, hang on, there's some armor back there. There we go, grab the armor. Med kit, there you go. I think there's also grenades on the table, if I remember right. <laughs> and here we go. Announced that the player's nearby will start getting to cover. Then, if they're feeling lucky, if their threat has been minimized enough, they'll try and push up. <laughs> Recognizing that there's a grenade.
<laughs> oh, you got one, all right. And then it's trying to figure out which one you got, because there was two of them. Not bad, not bad. You should be in the clear now. I don't think you'll have any more for a minute or two. Not until you go up the stairs. Yeah, you might be better sticking with a pistol at the moment. You've got about 15 rounds left in your SMG. Particularly useful. Oh, somebody knows you're about. Now, when that happens, this could just be a trigger coming from a squad manager telling it, oh, there's a player nearby playing animation, um, or, or which has a sound effect attached to it. Now, they might start patrolling. They might just stand still and just guard a particular location. It's really down to whatever they're told to do. So he started patrolling. There you go, grenades. Go get your second pistol. Jewel, baby. We'll just ignore the assault gun. You know. Okay, so what you do is you head to the right, because that door's blocked, and you can go to the left and jump over that stuff and then get in that room. If you turn around, there's a switch behind you where you came in. You're right. <laughs> No, nope, turn around. Right, right there. There you go. Yay! Now that's going to move that across, so you can then run. You can jump back across to where you came from, and then use that to jump over. But you need to go back to where you started. Don't try and jump it there. That's not going to work. Oh, that's what you're waiting. He's trying to get to cover. There we go. So he made an effort. He realized that the player was on him and said, right, I need to resolve this. The best thing to do was to get to cover. And there was cover. You can see that crate right there. That's what he was aiming for, because he figured that that was more safe than being at the crate in front of him. I think we got one last major fight before the end. You can do it! I think there's armor in that room. Mind you, there you go. They can open doors, you know. <laughs> They're like velociraptors. They figured out how to open doors. <laughs> so if you're lucky, you took him out with a headshot. Now, the other one's in a bit of a panic. It's going to try and get some sort of cover. He's went back to cover because he thinks you're roughly somewhere on that upper balcony. Now, he might pop up or he might find another way to get to you. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> They're now even telling each other where you are. You're on the catwalk. I was waiting for a joke, but nobody went for it. <laughs> okay, I think you're good. <laughs> no, maybe not. <laughs> it's more like an assault rifle. Okay, now I think we're good. Now, the interesting thing is that the, the characters, this was actually explained in a paper that was only just published in the last few months by a researcher, a planning researcher, Eric Jacopin, who I had the pleasure of meeting when I was at Ada to discuss his work, that he actually did a portfolio analysis on a number of different planners and games. Ooh, watch out! These characters are replanning every couple of seconds and their plans are only maybe four or five actions long. Which means the planning frequency is incredibly high. Which is kind of interesting, because it sort of goes at, 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 odd, at odds against the notion of planning. 
because we typically plan long term. But these, ta these characters are just planning out really short bursts of action and then rethinking what they're doing, which kind of works like, I suppose, an action context because they have to continue with their feet. We will need to finish off on the rest of this. Well done, though. I think, I think for your first attempt, you did very well. I think that, I think that was a good effort. I'd be pleased enough with that if I were you. So, let's finish this talk. And I can't remember where I put my clicker. That's not going to help. So yeah, like I was saying, uh, Eric Jacopin had actually done a bit of work looking at a number of planning systems that have been adopted in AAA games. And he went away and he actually spoke with the developers and said, can I get a hold of your source code? Which, particularly in academic circles, when you're asking a game developer for source code, it's like asking them for their firstborn. You got no hope in hell, by and large. But Eric managed to pull it off, and um, we were talking about it. Um, because he turned up at Ada, and I'd read his work recently, because he actually did a video discussing it with Alex Champendard on AIGameDev.com. And I listened to the video, and I thought, this is fantastic work. It's so cool to see somebody's actually done this. And I, I dragged him aside for a drink. Just, I said to him I was really, really interested. And in fact, he'd seen the blog post that I'd written on this and said, oh, this is a really nice piece of work. So it was great to actually meet him and talk to him about it. And he said to me, it took him a long time to actually get this body of work done. This whole portfolio took him a couple of years because he's been dogging game developers for ages, just hounding them, going, please give me your source code. No. Please give me your source code. No. Some of them were actually quite uh, open to it. Um, notably, actually, the team at Monolith, and talking to Jeff Orkin, he was very open to the idea. I think also Troy Humphreys, who's one of the lead AI programmers at High Moon Studios, he seemed quite open to the idea. Talking. Um, with Gorilla for Killzone, I think, took him a little bit more effort. He is actually looking at some more modern games, and it sounds like that'll be something that's going to take another couple of years once he's finally, you know, worn them down, and they just agree, OK, fine, we'll give you the source code if you just leave us alone. But, yeah, he had a look at how the Fear Planner works, and there's some really weird things. So, first of all, like I said, it plans very short plans, and it replans very frequently. So it works in the context that this is an action game, so they have to be fast on their feet. But it's also kind of weird because they don't think particularly long term. They don't strategize in the long term. And when you compare it to some other games that have now adopted planning, their plan lengths can be significantly larger. I think the largest plan length that Fear was coming up with was only about five or six actions. On average, it was less than three. But because they were doing it so frequently, it sort of negated that issue. The other problem was that they're actually hitting the planner quite hard because of this frequency in which they're replanning. There was also another interesting point. Remember how I said earlier that the rats use the same AI system as the other soldiers? Well, the non-player characters in the game continue to replan regardless of their proximity to the player. So the rats that you, you met in the opening 20 seconds are still replanning when you're two miles away on the other side of the map. They didn't realize this at the time, and it wasn't until Eric had done this kind of analysis of the planning system, he said, there's this weird overhead that's happening all the time while you're running. Even when none of your soldiers are planning, because all your soldiers are dead, there's this weird overhead. What is this? And he realized it's because there's about 50 rats that you passed by on the way through the map, and those rats, which, like I said, can be on the other side of the level, are still planning. I'm going to go over here, and then I'm going to go over here, and then I'm going to go over here, and then I'm going to go back over here again, and then I'm going to go over here, and then I'm going to go over here, while this whole massive battle is taking place on the other side of the map between you ten soldiers and a big heavy guy with a massive machine gun, and the rats are still just planning around everywhere. You know, ten, twenty, thirty rats all planning at once. And so, yeah, this was this current base, there was this, always this baseline of uh, performance and that was being caused because the rats were still on. And the best thing is that Monolith didn't even know. And he told them, and they're like, what? They went back, and they're like, oh, my God, yeah, the rats are still planning all the time. We never thought to turn it off. 
because they never noticed it was actually taking up any real amount of resource from the planning system. And apparently that's because they did such a good job of optimising their A-star, as Eric described. And so this kind of... Eric's look at this work is sort of tied into what I would consider to be the legacy of fear and its impact upon first-person shooter AI. Because the goal-oriented action planning system, GOPE, was not only used for Fear 2 and 3, we know it was also used in Stalker, it was used in Condemned, it was used in Just Cause 2, the first of the High Moon Studios Transformer games, or the Cybertron series, as it were, War for Cybertron, and even more recently in Deus Ex Human Revolution. The same system, the same concept, has then been applied in a whole bunch of different games because it works, and it actually works really, really well. But beyond that, GOAT was quite important, but it helped reinforce a point that, like I said, Strips has been around since the early 1970s. We're finally seeing that planning can be used in games, and it can be used really well. So, a number of people had used GOAT already, and then started looking at alternatives. Now, Guerrilla, I think, are probably the first team to do this on Killzone 2 and subsequently Killzone 3, uh, when they transition to a different type of planning system. And I've also written a blog on my site, which I may come back to in a talk at some point, because it's really interesting that the Transformers series, there's two games in particular developed by High Moon, Transformers War for Cybertron and subsequently the fall of Cybertron. War for Cybertron uses the GOPE system, but they realized that it was actually, had, it had its limitations. There was also some significant issues they were having, but that's not so much down to the, the, the method but rather the context in which they were applying it. That GOAT was only really built for games in the manner of fear, whereas Transformers is a different type of action game, and it required a lot more effort. They were having to really hit that planner a lot, largely due to the number of characters on screen at once. And it took a bit of a performance hit. And what they were looking at, Troy Humphreys at High Moon Studios said, let's do something a bit different. And they looked into what they had done with Killzone, which is called HTN planning, or hierarchical task network planning. And what we do is instead of looking at what we did there with strips, with strips we had each individual action, HTN planning requires you to build task networks. And it's sort of like how you think about things in your head. You think, I need to go to university in the morning. To get to university, I need to get out of bed. I may or may not need to grab a shower. I may or may not need to grab breakfast, depending on certain prerequisites that exist. I then need to walk to the university and get to my class, and I have achieved that particular thing I had in mind. That is how a task network is built. So the task networks are built in two ways. You either have um, primitive tasks and compound tasks. And a primitive task is essentially a strips action. A compound task is several strips actions glued together to do something more intelligent. And that also make, that makes a tremendous amount of sense, particularly when you're thinking about it on a behavior-based level, because you say, well, I want it to achieve a certain type of behavior. In fear, it's building behaviors more as a, a result of its search process. And it says, okay, I'm gonna run over here, I'm gonna do a bit of blind fire, and then I'm gonna get into this cover. Okay, that's resolved that problem. But there was like 10 other ways it could have done that, and some of them maybe aren't the smartest way to do it. In task network planning, you say, well, if you want to go to cover, here is pretty much the four or five different ways you can do it based upon certain information in the world. If certain prerequisites exist, you will also execute this action along the way. So if I don't know exactly where the player is, the action could just be running to cover and hiding behind the cover. But it might say, well, go to the cover, but if you actually know where he is, also stop and take a pot shot at him and then continue on to cover. So we, we model things even more abstractly than we already have. And that's worked to great effect. The interesting thing is both Killzone, I think it was Killzone 3, and Transformers Fall of Cybertron were also assessed in Eric Jacopin's work. And it's interesting to see that their performance is quite different. Notably, their, their plans they're generating are a lot longer. I think the record is owned by Transformers. Their sniper classes can execute plans of up to like 30 actions. And this means that the planning overhead is a lot lower because they don't have to replan as frequently because they've actually got a long-term plan of attack that they're trying to execute. So it's been a big deal, and it's actually helped shape a lot of things. And we see that right now, there's kind of, I'd say that there's really three big competitors 
in sort of the game AI field, you've got, I'd say the GOAT system still has its, you know, it still has its supporters and people still use it. People now look at HTN planning and there's also the likes of behavior trees, which I'll talk about in the Halo talk. Because it's interesting how they are all very much related, but all do the exact same thing slightly differently from one another. But they're achieving these long term kind of more abstract kind of tactical decision making. And with that, that is the end of this talk. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. And to finish off, I will announce the final talk for this semester. Won't be the final talk of the year. I will come back after Christmas, particularly if people are enjoying it. If you're not enjoying it, screw it. I'm not coming back. I'm just going to say this now. I thought we'd finish on a piece that I've been working on for a little while now. And it's been a little bit difficult because these talks, particularly the ones that are built around AAA games, I spend a lot of time on them. This takes a little while. These take me a couple of months, usually, to put together. But I've been sitting on this one since the summer, and I've not had as much time to work on it as I would like. But for the next week or so, I'm finally going to get around to finishing it. And it's called In the Director's Chair. And I wanted to talk about director systems. And director systems are an interesting alternative to AI that most people don't really think is actually an AI system, but it is. And the notion is that instead of being a character in a game, it controls the game itself. And it then has this huge impact upon how that game operates. Now, arguably the most popular, and probably the one that started the trend, particularly in AAA games, is Valve's Left 4 Dead. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff, both in Left 4 Dead and its sequel, in how they go about doing this. And this has subsequently had a big impact on a lot of other games, notably the Far Cry series and even uh, Warframe, which is one of the recent free-to-play shooters, which is on pretty much every major system at the moment. So yeah, come back for that. It'll be in two weeks' time. And we've got some prepared footage of Left 4 Dead. It even stars a couple of people in this room, myself included. But I managed to borrow some of the final years for a little shot of this a couple of months ago. But we will try and get a couple of rounds of it in the room, and we'll see how people fare. And also, it'll be interesting if you can then spot the patterns that are emerging in the director system, because it has habits, and it does certain things repeatedly. And it's quite cool to actually see what it's doing and able to predict when everything's going to go to hell. And those of you who've played Left 4 Dead know how that works. You think everything's going all right, and then suddenly it just starts going to shit. But you can begin to predict it, because you then understand how the director works. And with that, we are done for today. Thank you very much. <laughs> and does anybody have any questions on that, or are we good? I love this. I've got to this point where nobody has any questions. I think because you're all so tired, you just want to go home. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, thanks for coming out. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>